when we think about safety, we have to think about that as purchasing power. Because a lot of people think if I put my money into a treasury bill, I get safety. Look at whether that's giving you a return that's compensating for inflation. And maybe we're all wrong. Maybe there's nothing to worry about. So how do I deal with that? I want you to get balance. I want you to have enough savings, to have security. I think investing, which is the same as savings, comes in tiers. Tier one, tier two, tier three on risk. And the first tier is if everything goes wrong, I'm okay. And everything could be inflation, depression, anything, whatever it is. I lose my job, whatever it is, I got that thing covered. Then your next level is, okay, what am I going to get the highest returns? What is my best bet? But start at that level. And then it's not just the investment, it's where am I? Am I in the middle of a fight? Like, I don't want to be in the middle of a fight. What's it going to be like? For people that don't know your background, you have a meteoric rise. You're in your 30s on top of the world. Unbelievable success. You made a huge bet on a collapse and it didn't play out. And it ended up that the market went up and you lost a lot of money, almost lose Bridgewater. You come up with a new strategy. It ends up getting tested multiple times in the market and you guys crush when other people struggle. What I learned from, you know, basically this punch in the face mistake, how to make good money without having a big loss. I learned how to improve my return relative to my risk. The holy grail of investing is 10 or 15 good uncorrelated return streams. You get that and you will have a similar path to the path I've been fortunate enough to have. Something comes along all the time for anything. Everything has its time. You put your money in any one thing, you know, you could think, oh, okay, movie theaters are good and then you get COVID or you, cruise lines are good and then you get COVID and whatever it is, is good. It, well, it's good sometimes, but there's always something that always is going to mess up the one thing. So you don't want, like, in my opinion, you don't want more than 10% of your money in anything and they want to be good, different things. And that's the message I'm trying to convey. I look at three major forces that are happening now, haven't happened in our lifetimes but have happened many times in history. And those three major forces are the creation of a lot of debt and the printing of a lot of money to buy that debt, particularly because the government is running large deficits. They don't have enough money, so that government has to print that money. So that creation of all of that debt and its financial implications and its economic implications is one force. The second force is the internal conflict, the amount of conflict that's largely due to the largest wealth gaps that we've had since the 30s. That produces populism of the left and the right, particularly when there are financial difficulties. The third force is the rising power challenging the existing power, largely in the form of China and to some extent Russia. Let's call it the great power conflict. Because in 1945, you know, there's a cycle, you have a war, then after a war, you have winners, and the winners determine the rules of the game. And then there's this evolution of others becoming more competitive, and then you have a conflict again for who's in control. So we have that dynamic taking place. So those three influences, the financial, the internal conflict, external conflict influences, I learned before that when I was surprised, often it was because of things that hadn't happened in my lifetime before, but happened in history because of that reason. I went back and studied history the last 500 years on these cycles. There are big cycles that last about 75 years, give or take about 50 years of rises and declines. I think it's so important people understand that. I also learned in studying history that there were two other influences that were very big and you could see them. The first was acts of nature, such as droughts, floods, and pandemics. The changes over time in the evolution over time of people's learning and the technologies they make. So I'd say there are really five big influences that drive everything. And since they each affect each other, it produces what I call the big cycle. So as we go now into this, it's important. One man's debts are another man's assets. So what happened? Government had to sell a lot of debt. When it sold a lot of debt, there were a lot of entities that bought a lot of government bonds. 
And money was very easy, which meant that short-term interest rates were very low. And money was almost, it was actually being given away because they had interest-only loans and interest rates were less than 1% and you didn't have to pay back principal. So you could go get money. And so that created a lot of debt and it created buying of government bonds. What happened to many, many entities all around the world, not just banks. They, what does a bank do? A bank takes in deposits typically or debt in some way, and then it buys debt. It can do that in the form of making a loan, or it could do that in the form of buying a government bond, buying debt. And then when interest rates went up, the value of that debt went down. Money they had to give to depositors became more and more expensive. And also depositors wanting them to be competitive looked at money market rates or other rates and withdrew money from the bank because they had better uses. Okay, so what that leaves them with it's a banking problem that has happened literally for thousands of years. What they do is the depositors, you know, want their money back and they're holding assets that, in this case, have gone down in value. So they're broke. What happens for the economy as a whole is then they print the money because they don't want defaults. There's a tolerable amount of defaults and then you get past the tolerable amount of defaults and it just crushes everything. And so they print the money. It's not a banking issue. It is a global issue all around the world. Pension funds, insurance companies, the world is leverage long. Long, meaning they own stuff and they borrowed money to own it and it's going down in value. The big issue is the government can come in and print the money and give money to anybody they want to give money to. But when they do that, that typically devalues the money. Think about it, if you're holding a bond, you know, you got a claim on money, but the claims are too much. One way or another, you're either not going to get back that money in full, or you're going to get back money that's worth less because they print whoa, the money. Whoa. But if the money's hard, if that's going to be good money that's coming back, it's going to be hard for those entities to pay back because it's a lot relative to their income and cash flows to pay it. And that means that the default risk rises. However, it means that the debt will be bad one way or another. It's either bad because they don't pay it and needs a haircut for them to pay it, or because they do pay it with money that is going to be printed to come back. So think of it this way, just wanna make this clear, when there was the position that interest rates got a lot below the inflation rate, you're losing buying power. There's no good reason to own that. And there's a change in psychology because before there was, I own bonds, I'm getting a price appreciation, even though I'm getting, let's say a low interest rate, but inflation isn't a problem until it's a problem. Then when it's a problem, because they print so much money and they put it out, then inflation goes up and a light bulb goes off. People realize it's not safe. I'm losing money to inflation. And then the other side of it was you want to borrow and buy stuff because money's free. So companies borrow and buy stuff and individuals borrow and buy houses, interest only loans on the houses. I mean, like, OK, I can buy a house, I can buy an apartment. But that creates the imbalance where it's terrible to be a lender and a creditor. And it's good to be a borrower and do that. The Federal Reserve says, I better fight inflation. They change things. And so by raising interest rates, you know, real interest rates much higher, lo and behold, all the people who did all those things get hurt. Because yields got so low, tech companies and others, those who have a dream, they don't have to necessarily make profits. They're selling a dream and the money's gotta be invested. You see all of that change radically when that tightening of monetary policy. So now you sit there and have a lows. What is the value of a financial asset? It has no intrinsic value. Its only value is what it can buy. But there are many, many more financial assets out there there's ever been relative to the value of stuff to buy. There's too many claims out there. It's like musical chairs. If everybody says, oh, wait a second, let me get my stuff. Let me convert my debt assets. I want to get real stuff. That's a real problem.
And so that's the global picture on the first of those five influences. The fact that it's happening with the other influences is very important because they affect each other. So this financials picture, by the way, is the same as in the 1930 to 45 period and the same as they were throughout history. For people that don't know, that's World War II. Uh, it started with a financial crisis that then caused internal conflict. Mm -hmm. What do we do about the financial crisis? The populism of the left and populism of the right in this internal fighting. And four countries that were democracies chose not to be democracies because of the conflicts that were existing. And those countries were Germany, Italy, Spain, and Japan, because there's a lot of internal conflict over wealth when you have that. And so that creates a lot of internal disorder, in some ways, almost civil wars everywhere, some form of civil war. And of course, that happens also at the same time as there's the external conflict. First of all, everybody's fighting over resources. You have populists come to power, and the populists are not compromisers the way democracies work. And you've got to pick a side. There's no place for moderates. And the sides are, let's say, internally in the country, the left and the right, and externally, the Americans and the Chinese. And you've got to pick a side and fight that becomes the dynamic that is these periods of time. And these periods of time have typically lasted about 10 to 15 years. And they have various symptoms to it. Like a disease, like a cancer, you see stage one, two, three, four. If you have these things, you could look at it and you could diagnose and you see it moving from stage one to two to three to four to five and to six. You can see that taking place. And each time you come closer to a bad set of circumstances, bad financial circumstances, and bad fighting over things. The dominoes are beginning to fall. I mean, you know what the next dominoes are. For example, they're not going to buy the debt. Those who bought the debt and have too much debt and have debt losses on government debt are not going to buy more of that debt, for example. And therefore, when the government sells more of the debt, there's not going to be an adequate number of buyers for that debt. You know that those who are hurting because they have those losses won't make loans. And a lot of those loans went to real estate, particularly commercial real estate. And you know that for various reasons in commercial real estate, we don't use it the same way and so on. So you're going to have problems in commercial real estate. You know, as a result of these things, that a number of entities will cut costs in their various ways. And so depending on that, the job market is changing. You know, you see it, for example, in tech jobs, if you're in some of those areas that are getting squeezed, and you see the same thing, by and large, happening internationally. That value has gone down a lot. And because it is bought on leverage, there are bad losses in different places. And then the question is, what are you going to do with those losses? In most cases, quite often, you know, don't mark them to the market. Don't account for them and recognize those losses, which is kind of, let's say, hiding those losses and hoping in time, you know, it'll be fine. But that'll produce <laughs> a squeeze. That'll produce a problem. I think we know those things. And that's happening at the same time as we have an internal conflict taking place such as the presidential election, senators, congressmen, and so on, who are at each other's throats about this, who are going to fight with each other and fight to win. Not probably respect the rules as much, but fight to win for their side. And that's happening at the same time as we have the situation with China, most importantly, China and Russia, the issues in terms of their things to fight over. For example, even there's going to be an election in Taiwan that will also have a big bearing on this whole thing. We know, I think, that we're going to have financial problems and economic problems at the same time as we have this internal fighting and external risky situation. It happens over and over. The decline of the British pound as a reserve currency. Before that, the decline of the Dutch guilder as a reserve currency all happen for the same reasons two things are going on. First of all, they're holding all of this dollars and the stuff that we talked about is going on. And then also there's the weaponization through sanctions of the dollar. Um, in other words, 
the United States' greatest weapon to use, as distinct from its military weapon, is, is sanctions. And so sanctions mean you freeze other assets, you freeze assets. And those assets are the bonds. That happened with Russia, and there are threats of it with other countries, China and so on. And there's kind of the thinking, well, if I hold the bonds, can that happen to me? And then why am I transacting in this other third currency rather than transacting directly? For example, the United States' share of world trade has declined and China's share of world trade has increased to become greater. So if two countries are trading, let's say Saudi Arabia is trading with China, why do they go to the dollars in order to do that? No good reason to go to the dollars. And then they're worried about holding the dollars because they might get sanctioned. So you see more of those transactions taking place in other currencies. And then the usefulness of the dollar as a storehold of wealth changes. Think about it in the most fundamental way. Everybody wants a medium of exchange and a storehold of wealth. So in other words, if everybody's using the dollar in world trade, then you want to save in dollars because you say, OK, now that's the thing I spend it and I save in the dollars. But over time, as the share of world trade goes down, why aren't they denominating in like China has a larger share of world trade. Traditionally, the countries that have the world's reserve currency have the largest share of world trade and the largest share of world capital flows. And because the United States has declined, and also there's a worry about that, holding it because of sanctions. I mean, just imagine how the Chinese must feel about having a lot of money in treasury bonds. I would be worried that I would be treated like Russia would be treated. It's not something I would want to hold as you know a safe asset. And mm -hmm. other countries who might feel that they can get sanctioned. And for all those reasons, they're less inclined to hold. When we call dollars, what we're really calling is dollar debt, because you'd hold dollar debt. What is a debt? It's a promise to receive currency. Now, getting out of those things and transacting in other currencies seems to be the safer thing to do for those countries. And so that's the dynamic that's taking place. It's not an attack on the dollar. It's like, I don't want to hold those things. So very similar to British pound, you know, what happened is the British had the war and they were the most powerful empire ever in the world. And they had World War II and they came out of World War II financially in debt, a lot of debt. And who held the debt? All these countries held the debt because that was the residual from that. But they had a problem. They had a debt problem. They needed to print more money because it was too much of a squeeze. So it deteriorated and, you know, they sort of said, please hold my debt, please hold my debt. They went to Commonwealth countries, the part of those that were in the former British Empire. And then you had the Suez Canal incident where there's sort of a war and everybody realizes, well, hey, wait a second, that British Empire ain't the British Empire and they're heavily in debt. And then they say, I don't want to own that debt. And there went the British pound. So that's just how the mechanics work. The reason cycles exist is that the next stage has been determined by what has already happened in the prior stage. We are in debt a lot. You can't change that. We got a lot of debt. What could you do? I mean, two things come to mind. What you could do is you could be financially strong and you can not use financial sanctions as a weapon to scare the holders of those bonds. But to be financially strong requires you to not spend more than you earn. That means you either have to cut your spending or raise your earnings. That ain't easy. <laughs> okay, are we going to cut our spending? Infrastructure programs, poverty transfers, defense spending, what are we gonna cut? The most governments now don't think, how much money do I have to spend? And then how do I prioritize that? They think I need to spend on this, I need to spend on that, and I need to spend on that, and they spend on it, they produce a deficit, and then you either have to pay it back with hard money or printed money, and that's the situation. So when you say, what could we do? Well, you've got to get financially strong in a politically fragmented environment in which everybody wants more, be a higher percentage of world trade so that everybody wants to use your currency, and not threaten the holders of that bonds with freezing their assets. 
It's certainly better if you have two loving parents raising a family, that's good, but maybe that's too much to ask for. In other words, good parental guidance. Okay, you're raised well, you're educated well. You can go to a public school that educates you well and you have good guidance, so you're well raised in a healthy environment. And not only do you learn skills and all that, but you learn how to behave well with each other. So you learn civility. So you come out capable and civil to a land of opportunity in which you can work and have a good environment. And really, that's all you need if a society does that. And I think you know the things that are going on. Education is deteriorating. It's a real problem. And in the state of Connecticut, as of the last survey, 22% of the high school students have either dropped out of high school Whoa. or have absentee rates which are greater than 25% and are failing classes. They're living in areas that don't have the things I'm talking about, about parents' nutrition and so on. And there's not adequate resources for them. For example, during COVID, we found that 60,000 students didn't have computers or connectivities to take classes, and the government wasn't going to provide it. So our society, when you look at this, you see drugs, drug problems. You see how the cities are changing, you know, the cleanliness of the cities, the education levels of the cities, mental illness, crimes, and so on. You're seeing people fighting with each other a lot. Not all the time. There are wonderful places in the United States education, some of the best universities, you know, their neighborhoods, but there is this encroaching. So you see infrastructure breaking down. Earn more than you spend. Be well educated to help you earn more than you spend. And be civil with each other. Be productive. Like in Singapore, but it's true in other countries, there's a level below which nobody should go. Certainly children should not go. So there should be basics of housing, health care, certain basics because otherwise you build a cycle. When the children become adults, you might say, oh, it's up to them to do it. But if you mess up the children early, they become the adults who can't do it. So you have this cycle. You can see the gaps, the opportunity gaps. You can see the mental illness gaps. You know, walk down the street in downtown Manhattan or lots of places and see the gaps. And some adult who is screaming, uh, you know, and homeless and whatever, came from a place that made him that way. Think about how difficult it is for the kid who doesn't have learning, and they have one parent, and that parent in a poverty and might have drug problems and all that. I mean, the kid can't make it. So the kid's going to come up to be an adult. Okay, what kind of an adult is it? It's going to be a problem. What they did was they required savings. They require it? I think it works like this. Employee gives 12% of their incomes. An employer gives 10% of their income. So they save something like 22% of their income is in savings. They do other things too. They have a tax balance, but they have a savings. And as a society, they earn more than they spend. And then on housing, for example, they have a public housing that is subsidized that the person can take their savings to use to buy that public housing through that saving. So everybody has housing, good public housing, and they own it. So if it goes up in value, they can sell it. So the housing creates a good environment. They put a lot of money into education, equal education. People there don't have to go to a private school to get good education. And then they have the people who work hard and are civil with each other. And that's how it works. Forget about Singapore. If you look through history, these are basic fundamental things. So wherever they've happened in history, they've worked. It's so interesting to me because I found that when people get richer, the societies get richer, they typically get in more debt, which seems backwards. Like I watched the first time it happened when the United States started borrowing money from China. The United States had per capita income 40 times those from China, and they're borrowing money from China. So I wonder, like, how does that really happen? And there's when you don't have much money and you're at a stage of life where, you know, you value money, you want to save. So there's a psychological thing. You don't have much money, you get some money, and you want to save it. And to save it means you have to lend it to somebody. Then what happens is, ironically, when everybody earns more money and it's easy to borrow, people will get in debt. 
or society will get in debt or the government will get in debt. And also then there become very big wealth gaps. People basically are interested in taking care of themselves. You have a fight over taxes or something. And so you have a society that borrows. Just even think the political system cycle. If you're a new politician and you run a state or you run, let's say a state, and it's before an election, it's in your interest to borrow and spend because nobody pays any attention to the borrowing, where the money comes from. They pay attention to the spending. So go spend, give them stuff, have a party. It's like having a party on debt. And there's this short-sightedness. It's like raising kids, they call it the marshmallow test. You know, you ask a kid in an early age, I can give you one marshmallow now, or I can give you two marshmallows in 15 minutes. Which would you prefer? The smart one says, I can defer my gratification for 15 minutes and get two marshmallows. We have a lot of society who wants it now. So is it enjoyable to take your money and spend it on better infrastructure? So those are the mechanics of it. First, you have to go to bipartisanship. Like if I was president, I would have a bipartisan cabinet. And then if I was dealing with the economic problems, I'd get smart people from the right and smart people from the left who want to make this thing work. And I'd put them into like a Manhattan Project kind of thing. In other words, put them into six months in which they have to agree on a system that's going to work. Tie them together and force them to agree and come out with that and have them gain control over the extremists who are going to fight. Like, I don't really care exactly how it works. If smart people from both sides can get together and make it work, and then you come back to these basics, okay, how do you earn more money than you spend? How do you educate your children well and deal with those problems in a together way? You'll get the best outcome. I think it starts with worry. I got a principle, if you worry, you don't have to worry. And if you don't worry, you need to worry. Because if you worry, you'll take care of the things that you're worrying about to the best possible way. If you don't worry, and you just go headlong into these things, you're gonna have a real problem. So I think that you have to have people first realize what does that picture look like if we don't do these things, if we don't have bipartisan, if we don't solve these problems together, if we fight. You know, you have to see the clarity of those two paths and have people choose the good path. It starts there. It's not a structure. Where does the structure come from? It comes from people, okay? And it comes from people having a need to create a structure and a way of being. It's like wishing for the tooth fairy or something. I I mean, (laughs) it's like not going to the root cause of why you don't have that leader. If you look at history, this is one of the great challenges of a democracy. And when it gets into everybody fighting for their own cause with populism, you know, Mussolini comes to power to make the trains run on time because it's badly managed and so on. So somebody says, give me the dictator and I want that dictator. How do you get the leader? And what do you do with the opposition? Okay, it's almost like you have this fighting of the various types and do you accept losing? And then does the opposition remain and undermine everything you're trying to do? So it's almost like it gets to mob rule. That's why the dictators come to power. So that's just history, and that's all understandable, if not desirable, it's still understandable that that's the mechanics. So to wish and say, okay, we need a strong leader who will get control and make everything go all right, sounds a little bit like wishing for the tooth fairy. The only path I can see is the one that I'm referring to. If you worry about the alternative, if you worry, look at that, what is it? You must not have it. If the more people worry about that, then the more likelihood you won't have that. Let me just tell you the story very quickly of Mario Draghi in Italy. Mario Draghi used to be the head of the European Central Bank, which was like being head of the Federal Reserve for a number of years. And he and I got to know each other in that. And he's highly, highly respected. He's Italian. Italy has crazy anarchy. They've had an average of one prime minister a year. And so chaotic and so bad that all the political parties got together and said, we will be united under Mario Draghi. We will let him lead. We will turn it over to him. Uh And he said, 
I will do that only as long as all the political parties remain united, because if they don't remain united, we're going to get into this dysfunctional fighting, and I know it's not going to work. So for a period of 18 months, he was prime minister of Italy and very loved. People loved him. And then one of the political parties dropped out because they disagreed on his approach for, I think it was handling Ukraine. And he said, okay, now I'm resigning, even though everybody wanted him to stay overwhelmingly. But he said, I can't govern under that kind of a fragmented environment. In other words, he knew where it was going to go. So he resigned. And in the period between him resigning and actually turning it over to the new prime minister, we had lunch. And we were talking about these things. What he was describing and what exists is the issue that we're talking about. The inability of a leader to be able to lead when there's so much fragmentation. And if you look at the history of democracies, and you go back to Plato. You know, a lot of people think Americans invented democracy. No, no, it existed way back in the Roman and Greek times and all that. So he looked at the cycles. And what he said was, there's this cycle of these different systems. One leads to another in this way where what happens is the greatest risk of democracy is an anarchy because the fragments, it becomes uncontrolled. They all have their interests. They fight and they tear the thing apart. So what happens after that is then you get the dictator and ideally the benevolent dictator. In other words, the one who really knows how to make good things happen and he cares about the country. He doesn't care about his personal wealth and those kinds of things. And they create that to create order that comes about that. And then in that cycle, after a period of time, you inevitably get the incompetent or selfish dictator. <laughs> And then you have a revolution, and then you go to a democracy and so on, and these things go in cycles. You can't ignore the fragmentation and the inability to lead in that set of circumstances. God give me the serenity to accept that which I can't control. Give me the power to control that which I can, and give me the wisdom to tell the difference. And to be able to approach things in an open-minded way, calming yourself down. Think of a reality as being like a game, like a chess game. Okay, this thing happens and what's your next move? And how does it work? Because it's like watching the same movie happen over and over again. You can see it and you understand the cause-effect relations. It is what it is, that's how reality works. And then how do you deal with it? As we go into the 2024 election, I've heard credible people say that they think China is going to make a move on Taiwan in the sort of chaos of the division that we have here in the current global superpower. Do you see that as a logical move on the chessboard for China? Is that something that seems plausible to you? I have very good contact, so I have close contacts of both sides. And my opinion is that there's a political situation in the United States that it's really the issue of how much the United States pushes the issue in Taiwan that makes it uh, risky. So let me just give you the facts. I'm going to give you a little history. Taiwan was part of China and around 1840, foreign powers came into China and they wanted to trade and do things with China and China didn't want to do that. And so around that time, they had the Opium Wars in which the Chinese at the time said, I don't want to trade, you don't have anything that I want. Then they brought in opium that the Chinese wanted so that they would have this trade and whatever, and then militarily won and took over large parts of China, took control of that. It was many foreign powers. And in 1895, Japan takes Taiwan. Okay, fast forward. You go into World War II, and after World War II, the winners of the war get to divide up the world and said, who gets what? And Taiwan was given back to China. That's 1945. Then they have a civil war, as usual, the left and the right, they fight each other. So the capitalists get kicked out by the communists, and they go to Taiwan, and they control Taiwan. Okay, so everybody agrees that Taiwan is part of China, but they argue who controls China. The ones in Taiwan say, oh, we control China. And the ones in Beijing say, we control China. But everybody agrees with that. 
That's a big issue in their mind because it's part of China. And it's been told to them that it's part of China. Taiwan's part of China. But capitalists, they are living in Taiwan and they're not controlling it. 50 years ago, Henry Kissinger first gets together, goes to China and deals with reunification. And then Nixon follows. And there's this argument. And they reiterate that Taiwan is part of China. Everybody agrees on that. There should be peaceful unification of China. And that goes on 50 years now and brings it up to where we are today. So a red line for China is if the United States or Taiwan says Taiwan should be an independent country, that would produce a war. And everybody knows that. All those in government would know that would produce a war. This is a big thing for them. They call that period of time 100 years of humiliation. It was taken, promised back, and whatever, it's in their mind an indisputable reality. So what will come, I don't believe China is going to initiate a move to take control of Taiwan unless the United States crosses that line, pushes that line. So the way that it is understood, and just by different parties, is it's understood by the Chinese to be the way I describe it. Look, it's been promised, it's here. That's an uncompromisable thing. And Americans think about this communist dictatorial bully that is trying to take a free country, a free people, in a aggressive way, take over them, and that we need to defend liberty and protect them from that. I just want to emphasize it's more complicated than that in the way that I said. And also, from the Chinese point of view, it's part of the American containment strategy, which means China has grown and it's become a higher percentage of world economy and so on, and it's expanding. And it's like Taiwan is the lid on this boiling pot. If you want to know what really happens, watch it the way I describe it. In other words, is it unprovoked or is it provoked in the way I just described it? I'm a very realistic person. I'm not an ideological person. I'm not trying to, I'm just like, how does reality work? And what's the next move? And I'm just trying to describe that reality. I'm not taking a side in it. It's just like two sides in a chessboard and I'm just looking down at the chessboard. You can't expect somebody to understand all the things in finance and all the things in human nature and psychology. You don't need to. It just comes down to kind of pretty much simple basic stuff that repeats in a cycle for the certain reason.